Good afternoon. My name is Tim Northrup. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Services at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. In association with the Center for Business and Environment at Yale, as part of the GE Colloquium in Sustainable, Sustainability Leadership, and the African Student Interest Group, it is my pleasure to welcome to Yale Will Warshower, the CEO of TechnoServe, coming back as an alum today uh, of Yale College, meet with students and deliver a special presentation about which you're about to hear. Welcome also to our virtual audience. Before I turn this over to FES student Raymond Weiwuru, who will formally introduce Will, I just wanted to take a brief moment to publicly thank Will for coming back to Yale and taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you so much, Will. Will and I are old friends. We first met while serving in the Peace Corps in Sierra Leone in the late 1980s. Will was an agriculture volunteer and I was a fisheries volunteer. Together with about a dozen other volunteers, we lived and worked in the Koinadugu district in the northeastern part of Sierra Leone. It was there that for the first time we both experienced what it was like to live side by side with people in poverty and to think about what could be done to improve their lives. When Will was named CEO of TechnoServe last year, I immediately contacted him and invite him, invited him to campus. From our time together in the Peace Corps almost 30 years ago, I was inspired to know that Will was not only still thinking about these issues, but also leading one of the best organizations in the world, working on finding solutions to poverty. Welcome, Will. I'm really thrilled to have you back today. Raymond, if you would introduce Will. Thank you, Tim. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Raymond Waweru. I'm a second year MEM student here at the Forestry School and coach of the Africa Student Interest Group. Um, and before introducing our guest speaker today, I'd like to thank the Center for Business and Environment and the Office of Development and Alumni Services for all their efforts and all the time they took um, in making it possible to bring our guest speaker today, Will Washauer. So as Tim mentioned, Will Washauer is the president and CEO of TechnoServe, which is a nonprofit that works with enterprising people in the developing world to build competitive farms businesses, and industries. Will brings with him more than 25 years of experience in international development and the private sector. His journey to TechnoServe began as a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And since then, he has worked in over 40 developing countries, bringing that private sector solution to development fields that range from public health and microfinance uh, providing insurance and financing to smallholder farmers. Will graduated with honors from Yale University with a bachelor's degree in English, and he received a master's degree in public affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. He is a native of Washington, D.C., where he lives with his wife and daughter. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Will Washauer. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Raymond. It's uh, a great pleasure to be back at Yale. I am uh, not ashamed to admit that in May I'll come back for my 30th Yale reunion. So uh, uh, today's been a great trip down memory lane and uh, bula bula to all of you. And uh, for any of you who only know Tim as a nice, staid family man who glad handles alumni and all. I have photos from our Peace Corps time that I can show you after our talk today. <laughs> um, I promised you to talk about business solutions to poverty. And uh, so I thought I would start uh, with why business solutions to poverty. There's lots of ways to work on poverty. Uh, why do it in the way that, uh, that, that TechnoServe does. And uh, I'm going to uh, get us there in sort of a rambling way. Uh, you've heard now multiple times that I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone, and Tim exaggerates. Uh, in fact, it was not the late 80s. It was the mid-80s, uh, a long time ago when we were there. But um, I, I, I 
did spend two very formative years there, and I lived in a small village in the north of the country. There was no running water, no electricity, and uh, there was a, a boy who lived in my village. He was probably 11 or 12 years old. His name was Bolo, and uh, uh, there were no records or birth certificates or anything, but he looked to be 11 or 12, and he was one of these really special kids that uh, we all know and come across. A real sparkle in his eye, uh, really bright, really quick, even though he had very little book learning. There was a primary school in the village where we lived, but uh, it had no books and no supplies, and the teacher was not paid, so the quality of the education was, was not great. Uh, but I spent a lot of time with Bolo. He sort of hung around me, and, and we did various things together. And at some point in my time there, it sort of hit me uh, full force right between the eyes, that if our situations had been reversed, if Bolo had been born uh, in the United States, uh, son of a doctor, upper middle class, he would have, as I had, uh, gone to the best university and had the world in front of him. And if I had been born in his circumstances, uh, like him, my life expectancy would have been at that time about 40. Uh, I would have had that very poor primary education and no chance for more, uh, wouldn't have ever traveled more than 20 miles from that village in all likelihood. And uh, so that insight, which I talk about as sort of cosmic roulette, has set me on the professional path that I've been on ever since. And Nick Kristoff at the Times puts it more concisely and more better, <laughs> more better than uh, than, than I can, uh, he talks about this a lot. He said this again in his column, I think, on Sunday, where he was talking about to somebody from Somaliland who just got accepted at that other school up in Cambridge. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it, it's a fundamental truth. And so for me, the challenge is how do we provide that opportunity? And I have become convinced over a long career in this space that uh, leveraging the dynamism and energy and resources of business is the best way, certainly that a generalist like myself can do that. Um, let me uh, say a couple more things. I mean, uh, I think the numbers support this. Most of you are aware that foreign investment and business investment has far outstripped uh, official aid flows for some time now, depending on whose numbers you believe. Uh, it's four times as great to seven times as great uh, uh, every dollar of investment going into emerging markets versus uh, ODA, uh, Official Development Assistance. Even in Africa, I believe it was last year, uh, there is more investment dollars flowing in than aid flowing in. And so the action is and will be uh, around business and around investment. Uh, I assume most of you are familiar with this concept of shared value. This idea uh, popularized by some professors at that other school up in Cambridge, um, that there are intersections of uh, the social and the business where those imperatives can be met at the same time and indeed can create new business opportunities. And uh, I believe that we're at a tipping point around shared value right now in that uh, I, I've worked with corporations around development projects for many years. And I've been a part of some very bad and very cynical corporate partnerships where the corporate had one and only one interest, which was to burnish its image. And more and more corporations are understanding now uh, where those two things line up. Uh, corporations that were sourcing out of emerging markets, uh, many felt that if they could buy something 10 cents cheaper, uh, they won, zero-sum game. And more and more of them are understanding now that if the family that's producing that good that they're buying can't earn a decent living doing it, it won't be there when they want to come back next year and buy it. And more and more of them are understanding that if it can't be produced in an environmentally sustainable way, it won't be there when they want to come back and buy it again. So there's an alignment of the business interest and the social interest, and more and more corporations uh, see that, and more and more CEOs are staking out that ground. So there's a great uh, opportunity. The last reason I think that, that I've devoted my career to business solutions is that business solutions are a way to provide uh, dignity and agency to people that we work with. 
Uh, I'll talk about what TechnoServe does, and I'll give you some examples about it. But if we can help people uh, gain the skills that they need to earn their way out of poverty, to participate productively in various marketplaces, they have the agency. There's a lot of dignity involved in that, and, and there's the possibility that that's going to last over time in a way that charity won't. So um, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of this approach. What I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is uh, I'll tell you a little bit about TechnoServe, the organization that I'm honored to lead, and our approach. Um, but I will spend uh, uh, most of my time walking you through three examples. I don't know about many of you, those of you that are wired like me and learn and understand things through examples, this will be a good talk, uh, of work that we've done or we're in the middle of or we're undertaking to try to illustrate some of the points that, that uh, I'm making in this broader talk. I'll, I'll close with a quick uh, nod at some of the challenges that, that we see ahead of us. And I'd like to leave as much time as I can, 20 or 30 minutes, I hope, uh, for us, for me to try to answer any questions that, uh, that this might raise for you. Uh, this is us being less articulate than, uh, than Christoph, uh, but it is a good reminder about the three billion people that are still uh, getting by on less than $2.50 a day. Um, so uh, this is the mission of TechnoServe working with enterprising people to build competitive farms, business, and industries. And um, the, the quick snapshot is that we are almost 50 years old. Uh, we have programs in 30 countries, about 1,500 staff. Uh, although our headquarters is in Washington, only about 5% of us work in the United States, and about 95% of us are spread across the 30 countries where we're working. I'm fond of bragging that our headquarters is one of our smaller offices in the world, as it should be. Uh, last year, we programmed about $81 million in uh, activities, and this year we should do about $95 million, uh, give or take. So we're sort of a medium player in our space. And we're happy to be supported by a range of public donors, a range of governments, uh, most of the major foundations, Gates and Rockefeller and Ford, uh, and by a growing number of uh, corporations. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Uh, this is where we're working, in the green countries. So we are concentrated in Africa and Latin America. Uh, our only work in Asia right now is in India. Uh, and as we think and care a lot about scale, uh, India is an interesting challenge for us. Uh, although we're partnering with a government agency whose budget is $7 billion over the next 10 years, and they seem to be very interested in some models we're working on with them, so we think there's the possibility for a lot of leverage in that market. Uh, what do we do is a fair question that you may be asking yourself. And um, we aspire to work at a national level on large market systems, on entire value chains and to help transform those uh, at national scale, to be a catalyst in doing that. We uh, work often directly with smallholder farmers and small business people. And uh, when we work with those people, we effectively uh, work with them in three ways. The first is to help them gain skills. Uh, often those are business skills. Uh, as many of you know, many small entrepreneurs uh, often don't actually know whether they're making money or losing money uh, on their small business. Uh, and uh, one of the things we do with small farmers is help them reimagine their farm as a business and understand the, the costs and the investment opportunities they may have with the farm. Um, so whether it's agronomy skills or business skills, helping uh, people with information is the first thing that we tend to do. Helping them access finance is the second. We don't provide it ourselves, but we will make connections with uh, local banks, with international MFIs, uh, and other institutions to try to help small farmers and small business people access the finance they need to grow what they're doing. Lastly, and most interestingly, is, is uh, access to markets. Helping them uh, move up the value chain, helping them do some value addition, connecting them with players, uh, 
local, regional, and often multinational who they can do business with uh, to try to uh, help them integrate. And uh, you'll see in a couple of the examples, but it's quite interesting in today's world that a small farmer in rural Ethiopia can actually end up doing a fair amount of business with a major multinational, that the, the systems are in place to, to make that happen, and we will help facilitate that happen uh, to happen often. Uh, we're different than a lot of international nonprofits, and, and how are we different? Uh, I think I would start with the, the team. Most of the people who work at TechnoServe come from the private sector. Many of them come from uh, management consulting. We have a lot of, I call them recovering management consultants. Uh, we have long-standing ties to McKinsey, a lot of ex-McKinsey people at TechnoServe. And uh, they bring with them an ability to do analysis that certainly in my experience of the nonprofit sector is unmatched. And I think one of the reasons we've been able to, to be successful is that we've been able to, to do a really a profound analysis if we we're asked to help uh, think about what might be helpful for uh, lower income people in northern Mozambique. Uh, we have the horsepower to churn out multiple analyses of the mango sector there, the cashew sector there, and what's the current state, and what are the opportunities, and what are the trading opportunities, to try to design something that uh, works on commercial terms and, uh, and favors the, the smallholder. Um, this idea of us as a catalyst in a market is, uh, something that is evolving. We certainly over time are doing less and brokering and catalyzing more, trying to encourage the, the players in the market system or players entering the market system to uh, get into relationships that work in straight business terms uh, and that uh, provide meaningful gains for, for small businesses and small farmers. Um, and uh, it bears underlining the last point uh, we don't give things away. We work in some of the poorest parts of the world and with some very poor people, and, uh, but we believe strongly that the best thing we can do is help them gain the skills to enter into relationships with each other that work on straight commercial terms. Uh, and so it is tempting to say we're going to give free fertilizer for the next three years. And certainly that would help everybody increase their yield. The problem with that is fairly obvious, that when you go away and stop doing it, uh, it doesn't last. And so uh, we are uh, uh, committed to helping people get into relationships that work in straight commercial terms. Uh, how do we, the, the other thing I think we're, we're a little bit unusual in is that we're very interested and somewhat, some would say obsessed with measuring and understanding impact. And we have some top-line success metrics that we measure for every project we do everywhere in the world, uh, uh, whether or not the donor cares about it. And we aggregate those and track those over time. And these are uh, three of our most important success metrics. The 333,000 is the number of people we reach. And that's a tough number in the sense that we have to have evidence that you've changed what you're doing as a result of your interaction with us. Uh, so there are programs where uh, that's not researched or where there isn't evidence of behavior change and those numbers aren't in there. They'd probably, you could probably double that if you wanted to count everybody we touched, but we're not into the sort of we trained you once, so we're gonna count you uh, way of counting. The middle number, I think, is the most important one. This is additional attributable incremental revenue. The people that we worked with, how much more did they earn last year? And uh, we do uh, our very best to make this a, a, a thorough and honest number. So when we're looking at smallholder farmers, we will have a control farmer that we didn't work with in the next village over uh, to compare what's happened. So that if people's yields go way up, it could just be because it's a great year for growing maize. And we try to control for that so that uh, this is, to the best of our ability, additional earnings uh, because of some interactions with us. The last number, 23.8 million, is uh, external investment that has come in to the, uh, the people we've been working with. And we use that as a proxy for the idea that the, this impact will last over time. Uh, it's imperfect, but I think credible 
that if uh, an independent investor has judged whatever is going on as being worthy of an investment, uh, that helps the business with the extra capital, and that's another voice uh, saying that they think uh, these businesses and farmer organizations are likely to succeed. So um, there are a bunch of other metrics that are looked at, particularly in the context of particular projects, but as we try to look at and tease out uh, what are we accomplishing and compare coffee programs to cocoa programs to entrepreneurship programs and programs in Peru to programs in Kenya. Uh, this sort of analysis and a return on investment analysis I'm not showing you uh, is really helpful for us. Uh, last thing on us is just I mentioned uh, uh, corporate partnerships and I mentioned how I think that we're at a, uh, an important moment in time because I think that the the, the, the corporates have tipped over into an understanding of shared value, a desire uh, to pursue that. And so we're fortunate to be working with a lot of the uh, largest corporates, many of them who are sourcing uh, from uh, emerging markets. And uh, what's refreshing is that uh, we are, in the, in the past, as I've done corporate partnerships, they've often been conducted with a uh, uh, people in, off to the side of the main business of the corporation. They're in a corporate social responsibility unit, they're in a corporate foundation, uh, they're not really central to the business, they're not really where the money is, and that's who I often dealt with over the years. Uh, we are now dealing with the head of procurement, the CEO, uh, the head of the business unit, uh, because of this shared value idea, and because the businesses are doing this not to be nice and not to look good, but because it's actually good for business. And that's a profound and powerful change. Uh, and 85% of everything the Coca-Cola company buys in the world is an agricultural product. And so when you have the ear of the person who sits on the top of that uh, organization, it's a very powerful lever to be pushing on. Uh, so. Um, let me, uh, let me talk uh, a little bit, let me give you some examples, uh, and then I will uh, uh, talk quickly about challenges and we'll get into some, some discussion. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, three different examples with varying degree of good slides. This is such a lovely room. My slides don't hold up to the, how elegant the room is, but uh, um, the first one is, is work that actually wrapped up some time ago, but is uh, consistent with, I think, Techno's as TechnoServe's aspiration of uh, large-scale, national-scale change across an entire sector, and is also consistent with our, just as we are committed to not giving things to people, we're also committed to uh, exiting. Uh, the whole uh, way that we work of getting people skilled up and into sustainable business relationships in their market system uh, means that when that happens, we should go away. And so one of the things that I look at is how long are we doing certain things? Because if we're doing them for too long, we're really not doing it right and doing it according to our own principles, the old uh, teach a man to fish adage, and we, we take that seriously. Uh, the first example I'll talk about is in uh, Mozambique, and I apologize, I don't know how much you can see this slide, but um, let me summarize it for you. Mozambique, uh, uh, back in the 1970s, back when Tim and I were Peace Corps volunteers almost, um, had a thriving uh, cashew industry that uh, virtually completely went away after the civil wars of the 70s. and. Uh, terrible mismanagement of the country and its economy. And uh, we were asked to uh, help uh, revitalize that uh, back in the early 90s. We've been uh, working in Mozambique for, I guess, about 20 years now. And the work I'll describe happened over a number of years and was supported by a number of partners and, and involved others than TechnoServe. I don't want to paint this as TechnoServe did all this, but I think we were uh, an important catalyst and uh, so, again, doing one of these McKinsey-esque uh, deep dives, one of the choices we made early on that I think proved to be right was to uh, work with a number of entrepreneurs and set up a number of processing plants near 
the areas where cashews were grown. Uh, and that was a little counterintuitive and controversial uh, because they were a little bit less capital intensive than many of the plants that people thought were right, but the infrastructure and transportation in the country were terrible. Uh, so we worked with entrepreneurs to set up small processing plants, simultaneously working with farmers, and you really got a balance there because the farmers need somewhere to sell to, uh, to want to grow and supply, and the processors need a supply of nuts if they're going to have a viable business. So we worked on both sides of that. At the same time, we worked with uh, uh, government um, and uh, some trade associations uh, around uh, thinking about uh, marketing, and we helped them develop, I don't actually think that much of it, this all predates me, but a, a, a B2B logo called Zambique, which is meant to be, in effect, a sort of mark of quality for Mozambican cashews, uh, because the target was the export market. Um, and uh, long story short is that uh, Mozambique has become the largest exporter of processed cashews in Africa, fourth largest in the world. Uh, the industry is healthy with uh, over 10,000 new jobs and over 100,000 farmers participating in it. Um, and the, uh, the sort of trade association and services company functions. We have stopped providing any advice or support to the industry. Uh, many years ago. We're, we're occasionally asked for sort of one-off jobs. There was a processor that wanted to get organic certification recently, and we, we, we came and helped them do that. But this is a uh, commercial concern that has uh, improved the lives of a lot of people who got jobs in areas where there were none, and farmers who are earning uh, through selling their cashews. So this is in some ways a prototypical uh, success story from our perspective. Uh, big national transformation, large numbers, uh, catalytic role of brokering and, and helping here and there, and an ability to step back and exit and have this continue on. So that's one type of uh, example I wanted to walk you through. Let me walk you quickly through a couple more, and uh, we'll get to questions. Uh, one of the areas that we're working a lot on that's very exciting to everybody in the development space is around using technology to um, facilitate development. And of course, a lot's been written and said about the power of mobile phones, their penetration in all of these markets. And um, this is a, a public-private partnership that involved us, uh, the US government, through its aid agency, USAID, and Vodafone, a big uh, mobile phone company that is also one of the leading uh, mobile money uh, providers in East Africa. This happened in, uh, is happening in uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And uh, the idea was to make a system that would allow agribusinesses to connect with small farmers in an efficient way. And uh, so we helped design the system, trying to help everybody understand what small farmers needed and what agribusinesses needed and wanted. Uh, Vodafone paid for and built the system and own it. And uh, AID funded uh, effectively our part, uh, our work uh, on the project. And uh, what it does is uh, a number of things. I have a bunch of slides about it, but I think they may be more confusing than helpful. Uh, it allows. Uh, uh, farmers and businesses to exchange information. Uh, there, is a, there is a pest going around, and this is what you would use to treat it. Uh, farmers can tell agribusinesses that my crop's ready for sale. Um, but most interestingly, it actually lets business be conducted on the platform over the mobile phone. Because Vodafone owns these systems, many of you heard of M-Pesa? Okay most famous mobile money system probably in the world. That's a Vodafone project, uh, product under, under Safaricom in Kenya. And um, so uh, that's one of the mobile payment systems that's a part of this system. Um, but th that's been a real game changer because previously uh, a farmer would have to travel a couple of days uh, on a bus to go get his or her money. There'd be a risk of getting ripped off on the way back. Uh, it was dangerous, it was a waste of time, 
And uh, now uh, that can happen in real time, transferring over the mobile phone. It's a real game changer. It creates a digital financial record of that farmer that creates a whole bunch of possibilities, I think, in terms of helping them access finance. None of them have uh, any sort of financial records as they talk to financial institutions. Uh, it allows the agribusiness to have a, uh, a record of uh, their customers and clients. And uh, I think that the, what I've worked in mobile enabled systems in Africa. And I would encourage you, as someone tells you a story about a mobile enabled system in Africa, whether it's public health or uh, agriculture, the question you should always ask is how big is it? Because there are hundreds of great, interesting ideas about how you use a mobile phone to do various things. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of them haven't scaled. Uh, and I think one of the things uh, that is different about this, to go back to my old saw, this was set up in a, in a way that made business sense for all of the players. One of the great decisions that was made up front is that the small farmer wouldn't pay to use the system. The business would pay to use it. So that immediately made it uh, much more interesting for the farmer and uh, uh, economically viable. Um, this is now serving 30,000 small farmers, but we've taken orders, commercial orders, or Vodafone has, uh, for another 100,000 farmers to come on the system. So these are hard-bitten trading companies, groups like Olam, for those of you who may know them, who are buying licenses on the system and paying Vodafone for it. And uh, that, to me, is the, is the proof that there is really something here. The goal is to scale to a quarter million farmers. Uh, this is not, this is still just a little over two years old. But the, the, one of the most interesting things about this is um, in the public sector, there's a real hunger for successful public private partnerships. M PESA itself started as a public private partnership, and the UK government is fond of telling everyone who will listen that they were imp instrumental in helping to start that. And that tiny investment that they made launched a revolution, and they're not wrong. Uh, so this has been uh, very exciting, and the U.S. government is very interested to go to a phase two because this is so promising. Fascinatingly, Vodafone has, uh, is on the verge of saying, no, thank you. They see this as a commercially viable uh, uh, thing to do. They are planning to launch it in seven more countries everywhere where they offer mobile money in Africa. And so it's exactly the kind of outcome from a public-private partnership that you would want, where the public money is really catalytic, it's really initial, and it launches something that makes sense uh, on its own commercial terms. So um, that's called the Connected Farmer Alliance. I think I'll spare you uh, any of the data flows and other things about it. We can talk more about it if you're interested. Um, but I think, uh, I think I mentioned these three things which are different, and the last one was controversial, right? You got taxpayer money, but this big multi-billion dollar uh, telco owns it, owns the intellectual property, that's not fair. And how can we trust them to make sure that it still works for the small farmer over time? Uh, and those are legitimate questions, but I think it was indisputably the right decision to have them own it. I think that they invested several million dollars in building it, they're going to invest, I don't know how much, in rolling it out in seven more places. And I think that's exactly the sort of uh, result that you'd like to see in something like this. Last example I want to talk to you about is something which is very uh, new and very fragile. And next time I see you, it could be just a distant memory. But it is absolutely on the bleeding edge of shared value. Uh, it is so interesting, and so many of the techno servers are so excited about it. And it involves um, opening up the world's last new coffee origin, bringing coffee from somewhere uh, that people have never tasted it from before. Anybody know where the birthplace of coffee is? Sorry? Well, people say both. More people say Ethiopia. But there is a third argument as to the birthplace of coffee. And uh, that place is South Sudan. 
there is a uh, part of southern South Sudan, which even today, given all of the uh, violence in that country, is relatively stable, and where there are some biologically very unique coffee uh, plants. And uh, one of the companies that we work with and that has impressed me as being all in on shared value and all in on sustainability is Nespresso. And Nespresso is a, is a very, very interesting partner from our perspective for a couple of reasons. Coffee in general is something that TechnoServe has done a lot with and that's been very deliberate and it's been because a smallholder farmer can grow some of the best and therefore some of the most valuable coffee in the world. So that person with one acre or two acres can compete and can make meaningful income gains off a small part of land. The other interesting thing about coffee is that there is a very large and very fast growing demand at the high end of the market for really good coffee, and increasingly, coffee with a story. And Nespresso sits right up at the high end uh, with great coffee expertise and fantastic marketing. And that's the, that's the consumer they want to serve, the consumer that's willing to pay more for the best coffee and is willing to pay more for coffee that has a story. And so I'm embarrassed to admit it, we're the development organization, but it was really Nespresso that said, hey, is this a crazy idea? What about South Sudan? And uh, we said, well, that's a crazy idea. Uh, but we, were, we, we sent some people into South Sudan and we uh, looked at the situation. We took some coffee out and shared it with Nespresso, who tasted it and tested it. It's unusual, I don't want to get too much of coffee geek, but the good coffee is generally Arabica beans, and the, the not so good coffee are generally Robusta, so all the finest coffees in the world are Arabica. This is Robusta, but it's a, it's a very different kind of robusta with a very unique flavor profile. I've had the pleasure of tasting some of it. It's a very, very interesting and complex coffee. So they said, yes, this coffee is, uh, is something that we would like to do something with. And so uh, I, I'll talk too long about this. So, uh, But it, there's been a long process on the financial side of putting together a very interesting financial package uh, and trying to uh, work with the IFC and others to mitigate the risk the, that, that Nespresso is taking. Um, and then from our team, starting with satellite maps of the area and having people, s there are no records. I mean, it's unlike anywhere else. And so they were sitting there counting every tree and then trying to figure out, well, where would wet mills go? Uh, going out and testing the soil and trying to understand what packages we should recommend to farmers. Helping farmers uh, aggregate and helping some of them that didn't have coffee trees uh, plant new trees there. Uh, and helping them form groups to work together. Uh, there was a time when we had to evacuate all our staff out when things got difficult um, and they're back. But uh, uh, happily, uh, this coffee, look, I'm sworn to secrecy on this, so all I can say is this coffee is, will soon be on the market. There's a very small amount that's been uh, brought out, and it's going to be marketed in a very limited way. The next harvest will happen around the end of this calendar year, and the projections are for something which are three or five times as big as that. And so the early returns are encouraging. Um, this, the aspiration is that this is going to be the second biggest export industry in South Sudan after oil. Uh, some people think it already is because it's not clear what else South Sudan is exporting <laughs> beside <laughs> oil. Um, but I think more importantly, this represents, I have worked in South Sudan and I've traveled in South Sudan and uh, seen a lot of the intense deprivation there. And I am uh, so proud and excited to be a part of something which is providing some hope and some reason for stability. There are now farmers and traders who have a reason to work for stability because uh, they're earning. And I leave you uh, with the whole thing with one of my favorite pictures, 
which is a uh, South Sudanese farmer, coffee farmer, and what he's holding in his hand is the premium that he received for selling to Nespresso. And in local currency, that premium is worth about the average annual GDP in the country, about $200. And uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to, uh, it's exciting to think about the possibilities, and uh, credit to Nespresso for wanting to stretch and try this, and credit to the uh, excellent uh, TechnoServe team that are there. But I, I really do think this is at the bleeding edge, and we're really testing how much of a market system do you need to have to be able to do these kinds of programs, how willing, what can you structure financially. Some of your undergraduate colleagues have a program this semester, I think, uh, helping to advise us about other uh, risk, uh, risk mitigating financial products we can do uh, to help support this activity over time. Uh, it could all go to, uh, it could all blow up, obviously, given where it's going on. But it's an exciting, uh, it's an exciting activity, I think. Let me close by just uh, mentioning, uh, yes, that's, <laughs> he looks that happy. Um, let me uh, just give you a laundry list here. Uh, there's a lot in front of us, and you may want to talk in Q&A. Uh, the uh, climate change and the environment is, a, is an enormous issue. Working with small farmers over the world, we're working with uh, people who are among the most vulnerable and who have among the fewest choices of how to mitigate it. And uh, so we are We've, we've done some good work, but are, are aiming to do much more and think much more about how we can help uh, smallholders around adaptation, and I think, uh, most interestingly, how we can help better make the case to the business community that investing in climate-smart agriculture is uh, a good business decision. Uh, there is not as much buy-in and money behind that right now as there ought to be. Uh, the uh, staple crops are an area we're working more on. Uh, cash crops have some obvious advantages from our model, and staples are more challenging in some ways, but um, are important in some other obvious ways. And so that's an area uh, we're, we're working hard on. Uh, gender is... Uh, uh, so many faceted issue in so many of these programs, it's hard to know what to say, except that there's uh, great data, of course, that shows when women control income and assets, the household benefits far more than when men do. And so while traditionally what's interesting, when you go around the world and you're in different markets and people say, uh, well, this is a man's crop, uh, what you find is that it's often the high value crops are men's crops, there's no real reason behind that, and it varies a little bit market to market, but these are men's crops. Uh, our teams have done a nice job of saying, well, not really. Uh, and uh, having a lot of women trainers and women business analysts and working with whole communities and, and getting more women into more of these value chains and controlling more of the money. Uh, and uh, youth is another bulging demographic that we're doing some interesting work on in around uh, entrepreneurship and employability. But let me stop there. And um, uh, we have still got some time for Q&A, uh, so let me invite uh, any comments or questions anybody has. I think there's a microphone that's going to come around and find you. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm wondering why TechnoServe, or if you could just speak to why TechnoServe is a nonprofit and any challenges. Yeah, I will. Any challenges that that specifically brings? I'm Alyssa and I go to SMM. That's a great question that we're talking a lot about at TechnoServe. Um, we're about 50 years old, and so uh, 50 years ago when we were being set up, all of the interesting uh, hybrid uh, sort of organizations that are uh, happening now uh, didn't exist. So we've always been a nonprofit. Um, we've been exploring. Um, opportunities to do business in different ways in certain places. And um, one of the concerns we're still wrestling with is if we were to earn income in various places, would it uh, change people's perception of TechnoServe as an honest, 
broker if we were to have a financial interest in this coffee cooperative but not that one would we would would we be able to provide a, a similar level of service and would we be seen to be doing that um, but it is I, I, it is ironic uh, given how we see the world and how we help people we don't take uh, our own medicine in that sense. Yes, uh, how about right here? Um, hi, I'm Wang Yuson. I'm a second year MEN student. I'm wondering how do you prioritize the projects and how do you develop and evaluate the potential of each project? It, it links a little bit to the last question um, because a lot of this is around a lot of the analysis that I mentioned. I mentioned that our work in coffee is not an accident. There's a number of things about coffee that make it very promising for smallholder farmers. Uh, the same is true for cocoa, which is an area we have worked in, but I think we'll do much more in going forward. On the other hand, as a not-for-profit who needs a donor to fund our work, um, we're also out advocating and asking for uh, money from donors. And so it is both the analysis that we have of where we can contribute and it is where there are uh, people willing to pay for that sort of activity to take place. Yes? Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm a second year joint degree student with the School of, School of Management. Um, so I guess I had two related questions, one of which is you talked about the value that corporations um, are getting with by partnering with TechnoServe. Can you talk about what value that is besides the marketing? So if they're donating to you, what other value are they getting? So not, not looking at like Nespresso in that respect, like just corporations that are actually donating. And then my, I guess, second question is, do you see in the future, TechnoServe partnering with more corporations in development efforts um, as opposed to just, you know, partnering with them to receive donations? Uh, I think, uh, of course, you'd, you'd have to ask them, but I think the value is a very practical one. Um, take a major beverage company that decided it wanted to source all of its juice that it sold in Africa in Africa, which it hadn't done before. So we partnered with them to help them think about how to make that happen, and then we helped them implement it. So we were actually had people out training farmers about growing or harvesting mangoes or passion fruits or other things to feed that supply chain. So in that sense, it's, it's a shared value. I mean, in some sense, it's almost like they're hiring us as a contractor, but they're achieving a business objective that they want, and we're only a part of it because of the social objective. Now, it, it gives me an opportunity to say, and some of you may be wondering, yeah, this sounds really great, but the corporations are hard-bitten corporations, and, and, you know, is it always really work that nicely where everybody wins? And uh, it's, it's a question we worry about quite a lot. And um, I was pleased recently uh, to see we had a project with a major multinational who shall remain nameless that was supporting us to... Um, work with farmers in southern Africa growing fruits and vegetables that were going to be sold through this uh, corporation's uh, outlets. And um, that was great, and those are high value, and there's a nice win-win that you can design around that. But when time came to uh, buy the product, the corporation wouldn't pay the going market price. And we had, for six months, a sort of back and forth and a pulling and a back and forth. And eventually, I think to our credit, our people told the farmers we're working with, look, it's your decision, it's your stuff, but you know, you, if you can sell it for more money somewhere else, you'd be dumb not to. And they did. And uh, the corporation ended that support there. And uh, so it doesn't always have a happy ending in that sense. Uh, but I, I think we are, uh, pretty steadfast about why we exist and the sort of greenwashing concept that a lot of the environmental NGOs worry about, uh, we kind of worry about it as well, dealing with big food and other things, and so it's something that we um, think about a lot. I may have forgotten the second part of your question now. So 
Well, it's a fine line in terms of donating. I, I mean, in the sense, is it a donation or are they contracting for us? If the US government donates to us, they donate to us to run this project in this country. If Coca-Cola donates to us, they're telling us to do this project in this country. So I think technically it's a donation. We're a 501c3, they may get a tax benefit. Um, but in some sense, they're interacting with us more as a business partner, or as much as a business partner. Wow, uh, yes, right there. You mentioned that you, uh, you try to focus on exiting from the relationships. I was wondering if you at all measure um, the, uh, the welfare, the success of the organizations after you've exited um, working with them. I love your question. Uh, and she is not a plant. But um, it's interesting because as I've described it, I hope it came across, a major part of Technosphere's value proposition <laughs> is that indeed the gains that people are realizing will be maintained. Well. We actually have no data about that. Uh, so I've been asking for the, so, and also it's very hard. Donors are happy to fund a lot of evaluation during the project, but I, I've been going to them for the past year and saying, we want to go back and look after the project. And they've all sort of looked at me like, what are you talking about? I've just gotten a foundation who's just sent us a check to do exactly that. And we're going to go back and look at a cohort of farmers, farmers we worked with five years ago who had very well documented gains in yield and income as a result of working with us. So we are gonna have data by uh, the middle of next year about what happened to those farmers in the five intervening years. Have those income gains persisted? Have they maybe even gotten better because of all those great skills we gave them? Or God forbid, have they gone away? Uh, we're hopeful and relatively confident, but we won't know. We're hiring an independent research agency to do it. We're gonna make the data public no matter what it shows. Uh, so I'm committed to having more of a uh, a, a research base so I can answer your question with real numbers the next time you ask me. Uh, yes in the back or yes, let's go to the back and then we'll go to you in the front. Hi, I'm Sheer. I'm a first year MBA uh, student. I was wondering, um, so it seems like TechnoServe is very well positioned in the shared value space because you can help companies with their supply chain um, management, right? Um, how can you uh, generalize that and what role do you play in promoting shared value um, throughout the sector? Um, what, what do you see as kind of TechnoServe's role as a model? Uh, well, I think we're, we are primarily an implementation agency, although we may do more thought pieces and publishing at some point in the future. So in that sense, we hope our implementation speaks for itself. Uh, corporations talk more than you would expect to each other. So in that sense, I think um, some of that work ha has a knock-on effect. And there is a number of groups. There's a shared, shared value coalition run by a consultancy called FSG. Uh, and Porter and Kramer continue to publish it and talk about it. So um, I think that shared value has a good amount of momentum um, already. Uh, I, I think that um, it, it's, uh, we're, because this tipping point that I talked about, we're increasingly reactive. We're increasingly having a CEO announce that the company is going to source 100% sustainable by 2020 and having his team call us and say, how the heck do we do that? So in that sense, I think we, we can play a great role in helping figure out the nuts and bolts of how do you achieve these really lofty goals. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Anna Lippin. I'm a sophomore, actually, in Yale College. Um, Go Yale I, College, Bula yeah, Bula. Bula. Yeah, and Ezra Styles. Um, well, uh, JE, but that's all right. Uh, yikes. Um, I was wondering how you identify markets and countries to enter. So, like, what is the impetus to? What was the impetus to enter Chile versus Kenya versus India? In South Sudan, it was coffee. Is it usually a, a one specific small business or sector, or is there sort of concerned efforts to get into a certain country? Yeah, look, I'm sorry to tell you that it is, it is really, unfortunately, sort of a hodgepodge, and in some sense, sadly, less strategic than you would sort of hope or imagine. Uh, we do a lot of analysis, and we have priority sectors, uh, and we prioritize them for some of the reasons that I described. Uh, and we are a not-for-profit uh, whose efforts are 100% funded through donations. So it is really a mix 
of our focusing, and we're out asking, um, and our, the, the percentage of all of our donations that come via sort of com competitions that people ask for proposals versus what we submit is probably close to 50-50, which is much better than most of our peer groups who are just responding to RFPs. So we're planting those seeds, but they don't always get picked up. Um, and so, uh, alas, until I can figure out how to grow a big, big money tree in TechnoServe's backyard, we've got to sort of blend uh, our analysis with the need with the willing uh, funder or funders who will support the work. Yes, sir. Um, you had a PowerPoint that started out with staple crops. Yes. And you mentioned fruits and vegetables on one project but you've also talked about exports like coffee and cocoa and chocolate. What, what percentage is of your overall activity is split between staple crops versus exports? And second part, how would you respond to one of my former teachers saying, who has worked a lot in Africa, saying that if you do an export project, all the money eventually goes out of the country, and then the farmers have nothing, and then there's a much higher risk of famine with exports than with staple crops. Uh, in terms of the first part of your question and the spread, um, I don't know. I probably roughly 75, 25 towards um, cash crops uh, and 25 around staples. Uh, I don't think that I would agree with your professor entirely, but I certainly would acknowledge the risks, and one of the risks more people talk about is just the fluctuations in world prices. And so um, one of the things that helps mitigate against that is that at least in Africa, uh, nobody is just a coffee farmer. Uh, everybody that I have seen and everybody that I think we work with who's growing coffee is also growing other crops. And many of our programs around cash crops simultaneously have a component around a staple. So a lot of our coffee farmers, we have a maize component, a corn component that works with them. That's not a complete answer, but it's an honest and, and I think a good faith effort on our part to help uh, them have a way to manage this risk uh, that's associated with uh, a global commodity whose prices will move around. Yes. Hi, my name is Garrett Wong. I'm a joint degree student with the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs in the School of Management. Um, I really like how TechnoServe works with a bunch of different stakeholders in the area. And in particular, I think you mentioned that you go around organizing farmers. Uh, is that correct? It, it depends on the setting, but often, yes. Um, and I was curious. It seems like there may be some overlapping interest with those types of activities and the national governments that you're working with, um, whether it's from an organizing standpoint or from a policy standpoint. And I was curious to what extent do you work with, you know, not USAID and you know foreign investment, but um, with the local governments themselves and sort of promoting your agenda. Well, again, as we think about an entire market system or an entire value chain, government's inevitably an important actor in that. So I would say we're, never are we not dealing with the government. Now, in what respect are we doing that? Is there a key policy change that would help? Uh, all of these governments have large ag extension services. Uh, the quality of those services is incredibly variable. And so in some sense, some of the pretty simple agronomy that uh, either we are teaching to farmers or sometimes uh, ag input companies are teaching to them, in many ways ought to, could be uh, done by a, a government extension service, but isn't. So um, I, I think it, it's very context specific, uh, but certainly uh, in our worldview, the enabling environment for business and the enabling en environment for, for smallholder is a key sort of set of policy things to think about, uh, and we're often very engaged with government uh, around that. But what are some of those policies? Uh, everything from uh, uh, transportation infrastructure to tax regimes to tax on key inputs that they need uh, to the availability of seeds and fertilizer and, and uh, 
Yeah, um, and, and again, it's hugely variable. Uh, I'm thinking of an East African country that controls that incredibly tightly, and the knock-on problems that that causes uh, across a value chain are, are really myriad. Two more, questions. Two more questions. How about right here? Hi, I'm Kirsten, um, a second year at SOM. Um, this is kind of piggybacking off a question from earlier, but I'm wondering with the research that you're planning to do um, about the five years yeah. since, um, if you're planning to look at anything other than revenue, so um, in thinking about long-term stability, are you gonna measure education or if their children are being educated or any other factors that maybe revenue doesn't capture? Uh, yes, uh, but so, uh, <laughs> if you get me started on this, I'll talk for a long time. Uh, there, there are a couple of things that we did with those farmers in that project, and one of them was some agronomy stuff to help raise the yields and the quality, and so we're going to look at that. Another was a, a business model that provided them some business services, including some local processing, and so part of that is to understand the extent to which those are still functioning. So the economic look is a little broader than I summarized it at. Um, we are hopeful that the grant that we received would fund not only that, but some of the research that you um, ask about. And uh, historically, we haven't been funded to do that. Uh, as I'm fond of reminding my colleagues, that's why we do this. <laughs> we don't do it for the money, we do it for what the money buys. Um, anecdotally, uh, I personally, every time I'm out in the field and I'm meeting with a farmer or a small business person and she's showing me her books and showing me how much more she earned, I then say, and what, what has that changed for you? What's changed for your family? And I'm really happy that very, very often I hear exactly the sort of things you would hope to hear about my kids are in school, uh, I've got a metal roof on my house, I've got savings for the first time in my life, um, those kinds of things. But we have not historically gone out and gotten that data. Um, hopefully, we'll have some of this grant to be able to do it. Uh, last one. Uh, how about the pink shirt? I love pink shirts. Uh, thanks. My name is Ben Cohen. I'm a joint degree between FES and the School of Management. Um, you mentioned climate change is a major challenge facing uh, uh, smallholding farmers right now um, or in the future. What kind of considerations are you making around climate change right now to, like, when you're talking to farmers or brokering these linkages to ensure that the products and markets that you're promoting are not maladaptive in the long term? Well, I think is some of that is the upfront choices. Uh, there are certain crops, uh, as I'm sure you know, which are much, much more problematic. Uh, it's one of the reasons we're not uh, active in oil palm, for example. Um, but I, you know, I'll be frank with you, I think we have some work to do. We, we've done some good work, and certainly at the farmer level, uh, in terms of how do you uh, uh, grow certain things in a more environmentally sustainable way? How do you adapt to some of the changes which, are, which you're encountering with your crops? That's a starting point and helps some people. It's not the larger, more leveraged, more powerful kind of solution that we like to go after. And I'm not sure where we'll find that, although my hunch is that it is going to be helping bring business along. Uh, that underlying premise that they've got the resources and um, if you can get them seeing a business case to invest there, that that, that will uh, move things as much as anything that we can contribute. But that's, a, that's kind of the best answer I have for you now. Uh, great, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Will. Yeah. Yeah, many thanks for the very informative presentation and giving us that business lens approach to, uh, to poverty. And thank you guys for your interest and for the talk. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. I promised I would make a plug. Some of you may know, but I want all of you to know, TechnoServe runs what we call a volunteer consulting program. And every year, uh, people who have the profile that many of you have uh, come and work with us and donate two or three months of their time and travel to the field and carry out a consulting uh, assignment for us, often a sort of sector analysis kind of consultancy. So uh, if any of you are interested in thinking about that, there's a lot of information about it 
um, on our website or come up and, uh, and see me after the talk. But it's one opportunity to take some of the hard business skills that many of you have and, uh, and apply them in this kind of space. But thanks again for uh, today. I appreciate it.